So, um, welcome everybody to our this week's Brownback seminar. Uh, I'm very glad to introduce Asli Aigunich, uh, who's a visiting fellow at the center this semester. She's completing her PhD in gender studies at Selangji University. Uh, she's in her fourth and uh, final year. Um, and she's looking at volunteering organizations, especially with a gender focus, and she will be reflecting on her research and in particular that larger topic of volunteering and civic participation in gender NGOs uh, in Turkey. So Asli, the floor is yours. Thank you so much uh, for joining me for this presentation. Um, I hope to have a wonderful discussion with you all. I, today I will be talking about my dissertation research, um, which is about, like Florian said, um, experiences of volunteers working in gender NGOs in Turkey. I will uh, today share with you the preliminary themes. Right now I'm at the point where I'm uh, coding the interviews and uh, bringing the discussions together with um, theoretical approaches. That is why I'm, I value your feedback in response to this presentation as it can also guide my um, writing and thinking process. So let's start. Oops, sorry. Uh, first, I want to briefly talk about the outline and what we're going to talk today. I, th I will give a brief information on research, my research questions and the research method I followed for this study. Then before starting to explain the two preliminary themes, I want to set the scene for you and um, talk a little bit about the historical and political setting in Turkey. I think we cannot separate the current context in Turkey from my research topic and it will be hard for us to discuss this research without understanding the political and cultural climate surrounding the individuals I interviewed. Um, then I will go on with the two themes and, that I find crucial in the interviews and uh, I will give a couple of examples from the interviews as well. In this research, I look at volunteers' experiences working in gender civil society organizations in Turkey. I was curious about these experiences, especially under the current political climate, uh, which can be described as sexist, anti-feminist and conservative. This study through situating volunteering and uh, gender at the center aims to understand personal, political and social consequences of engaging in activism and working with civil society organizations specifically in gender CSOs in Turkey. Uh, these are my uh, two guiding questions in this uh, research. The first one is, um, how do experiences of volunteers actively engaging in gender activism can inform our understanding of feminist collective activism in Turkey? And in what ways volunteering affects uh, volunteers' articulation of feminism, activism, and their self-involvement in the movement. I am using affect purf purposefully in this question and I will uh, discuss it further in this presentation. In order to conduct this research, I have initially planned an ethnographical approach by volunteering in a gender CSO in Istanbul. But however, of course, uh, considering the current corona situation, I have decided to change my method to online interviews. So far, I have conducted interviews with 30 volunteers. They are all women and they're all working in gender CSOs in Istanbul. Um, participants' ages range between 25 to 65 years old. They are students, lawyers, educators, retired professionals, and private, private sector employees. And they mostly volunteer at uh, different collectives or foundations with focuses such as violence against women, uh, women's marches, girls' education, and LGBTQ plus rights. As volunteers, they take up different forms of volunteering. They engage in um, physical forms of activism, such as occupying the streets and actively protesting or handing out flyers. But they also engage in more distant or online activism too. Um, they, these volunteers also translate articles, write blogs, and design social media posts to raise consciousness. Um, during the interviews, we talked about how they started volunteering and what types of duty, duties they have as volunteers in the NGOs they work in. 
Uh, we also discuss the type of organization they are in and their daily encounters with volunteers, the ways they balance their volunteering work and paid work, and of course the current feminist movement in Turkey and the way it feels to be a part of this movement as a volunteer. Um, we can of course uh, further talk about the method if you if you have any other questions i am happy to explain it further so i think uh first it will be useful for us to set the scene before um, talking about volunteering in turkey uh, there is ample research on the history of civil society in turkey for the sake of time i would like to start with the eu accession period since i believe we still have, we still see the positive and negative effects of that period. Uh, in 1999, after the Helsinki summit, Turkey has been declared as an official candidate for EU membership. This period, sometimes referred as the accession or the harmonization period, had vivid effects on civil society and its relationship with the state. Turkey has formulated democratization packages to change political and legal regulations towards uh, an EU perspective, which is a more equal and democratic and free society. EU also gave utmost importance to uh, improving civil society ac activities in Turkey and um, strengthening their social and political presence. So they, during the accession period, EU funded many different projects and um, they supported projects about civil rights, gender equality, environmental protection and uh, legal justice. Due to this increased funding, NGOs became more active in carrying out projects and forming public opinion in Turkey. And also state wanted to initiate a dialogue with NGOs and they were more responsive to uh, recommendations coming from NGOs because the state wanted to show EU that they are willing to cooperate with uh, the civil society in the future. Uh, of course, uh, women's movement had found itself a strategic role in the EU accession period. Through the work of women's NGOs, gender equality claims were made and uh, legal changes were requested and actually government had to respond to these requests, um, especially regarding the criminal code, uh, which gave way to sentence deduction uh, in women's murder cases. There were significant changes in the penal code. Uh, we can see a more united, uh, active and participatory women's movement during the EU accession period. Uh, EU has also involved women's organizations in the reporting process, uh, taking their observations and recommendations from the field and added these into the way the Turkish state was evaluated for membership. In around 2004, however, the EU accession discussions came to a halt as uh, EU's demands were not met by the Turkish state. And uh, coming to 2010s, we start to see a more authoritarian tendency in the Turkish state. The state has become very central to economic, political and social life. Also, the increasing conservative emphasis on politics and social life started to show its uh, negative effects on women's lives. There was an increased focus on pronatal politics or uh, family as an important social institution and especially family had to be protected by the government. In 2013, uh, the Gezi protests uh, started, even though they started as a reaction to state urbanization politics, it soon turned into a massive protest against the state and its authoritarian regime. This actually showed the possibilities of individual uh, activism and collective movement in the society so civil society was a huge part of these protests. But soon, of course, when the movement slowly faded away, the state tried to control the civil society and collective action once again. More than thousands of civil activists and uh, business people have been detained and jailed. 7,000 academics have been removed from their positions. Hundreds of media outlets and TV stations have been closed and more than uh, 1,500 civil society organizations have been dismissed. 
And in 2016, uh, which is the most current uh, event in Turkish history, uh, there was a coup attempt in Turkey, uh, immensely argued as orchestrated by a religious leader, Fethullah Gülen, to overthrow Erdogan and declare an Islamist uh, religious state in Turkey. After this coup attempt, Erdogan declared a state of emergency for consecutive short periods, and the state of emergency last, lasted about three years. So as you can imagine, this has also stopped a lot of activity on part of civil society, because uh, civil society lost a lot of leaders and volunteers. People were more hesitant to join in movements. When we look at today, we're still living in the aftermath of this coup attempt and uh, of course the Gezi protests. The state practices utmost control over freedom of speech. There are still thousands of journalists, civil society agents, academics being uh, tried, as well as uh, living in exile. Some authors claim that the civil society is um, downsized and they have limited access to politics and social change. This also changes its impact on a uh, number of people willing to volunteer at CSOs or supporting a cause by their donation, donations. And there, it is argued that um, people are scared actually to be out there and to do something about whatever they care about. Uh, so today we see a very downsized and uh, limited civic action actually. This timeline and especially the, the period after Gezi protests have particularly sparked my interest towards uh, civil society and the actors in it. I have had people volunteering around me in NGOs that work with women, girls or marginalized uh, communities such as refugees, refugees. I wanted to understand how these people kept on volunteering in a separatist and controlling political climate like this how it felt to volunteer in the space and uh, work with people that are traumatized, affected and marginalized further by economic, political and social turmoil every day. So uh, this brings me to my preliminary arguments in this study. Uh, I am still analyzing the interviews and there are of course a lot of uh, different arguments as well, but I think these two themes are, are sticking out to me uh, the most. The first one is how state and politics is an important factor in motivating and demotivating volunteers to engage with the civil society. And the second theme is related to the role of emotions in the way uh, volunteers engage in feminist activism, their emotional attachment to the movement, or in other words, um, their emotional belonging to the movement, and how this belonging is felt through solidarity are also um, crucial themes in the interview. So I want to give a couple of examples from the interviews to support uh, these two uh, arguments. The first one, uh, the first theme is that these volunteers viewed politics as a pulling and a pushing force that both motivate them to volunteer but also demotivate them because of the, the negative uh, experiences they have in the moment and in their daily lives. It is of course very hard to analyze volunteering experiences detached from Turkish politics. You are as a volunteer immersed in those politics. Uh, you, you deal mostly with the negative consequences of daily political decisions. As I have explained earlier, the, the political climate in Turkey can be described as unstable and anti-feminist. Uh, this actually motivates these participants to volunteer um, living in this political unstability and um, being directly affected by the anti-feminist claims as a woman is definitely one of the reasons why these women choose to volunteer. Almost all women in the study stated that they have started volunteering at an early age, around high school years, after realizing the discrimination and abuse they face on a daily basis. Um, be it the cat calling on streets, um, watching news about violence against women, listening to um, stories of their friends, um, they eventually felt the need to do something about it. These women engage in volunteering in different forms, but the reason why they engage in it uh, remains, the similar, remains similar. 
they wanted to criticize and lay bare the heterosexist and patriarchal nature of the society and the, the inequalities they face every day. So the first example, it comes from uh, Eylem and uh, she's uh, talking about her first encounter as a volunteer in the movement. And uh, she said, when talking about pronatal oppressive politics, she says, this surfaced with the abortion law proposition around in 2012. Later, pronatal politics focusing on family as a unit became more dominant. That is why you have to refer to those. This is something that truly affects our lives. Of course, you can't talk about anything else when there's such a prevailing event. So we started to see that abortion is only a smaller part of a bigger political argument. Therefore, we had to work on this. Of course, it always got worse. Um, she's actually referring to, uh, in 2012, Turkish government tried to lower the legal abortion a timeline from uh, 10 weeks to four weeks and there were a ma major uproar against this decision by a woman and the photo actually depicts that it's a protest in Istanbul for uh, abortion rights and a lamb's account shows us that politics have a role in the topics volunteers uh, choose to work on they want to be relevant to current political climate climate and address the issues that are challenged by the state. For her, abortion law proposition made by the state was a starting point. She joined the movement to protest against this because the decision greatly affected her life and other women's lives. From then on, she also started to discuss and criticize the general uh, political conjuncture. Uh, therefore, the politics was the motivating force for Eylem and uh, led to her involvement in the movement. And later, politics has also become the object on which she built her, her volunteering and her activism. Another example I want to present is uh, Denise, and uh, she's, uh, she's also talking about volunteering and politics. She says, the times we live in make our lives harder. To volunteer is a luxury, to be honest. For me, when I think about my life, I try to volunteer as much as I can, yes but it definitely makes my life more difficult too. Before you start volunteering, you have to think about this too. So in, in this account, politics make Dennis's life harder. Her life and her choices are determined by those politics. There's a struggle to find balance in what she's offered by the social and political conjecture and her aims as a volunteer. Uh, the luxury here is actually to have the possibility and have the the, the choice, the, the possibility of choice, uh, because she can choose to be a volunteer. Uh, because you may be motivated as a person to care for others, but you might not have the socioeconomic conditions to do so. That is why I believe uh, politics, politics stand out as a crucial factor, determining the, the topics volunteers work on, the ways they volunteer, uh, the, sustainable, the sustainability of volunteering and the way they understand uh, their experiences. From here, I wanna move to the second theme, which is emotional at attachments. I would like to emphasize that feelings are a great focus point to understand both uh, private and political negotiations about volunteering. Research on emotion is uh, valuable since it, since it can bring forward how individuals navigate the in-betweenness of public and private contexts. Uh, feelings and emotions have also con contributed greatly to my research and understanding how these women discuss their presence and um, belonging in the moment. Of course, uh, when we talk about feelings, we can't talk about a linear structure participants in the study explained that they feel anger, hate, discomfort, but also hope, happiness, and satisfaction at the same time. Most of, part, most of the participants agree that volunteering can be emotionally draining. It is emotionally challenging because for volunteers who directly work in the field and engage with other people, so to say, um, violence victims, um, they listen to traumatic stories and sometimes take the emotional baggage from the victim onto themselves. So uh, he, in this study, I did interviews with seven women lawyers 
who work in a known collective that closely uh, focuses on the violence against women. Uh, these lawyers take on murder and violence cases of women or children to represent them in court voluntarily. Uh, this volunteer work entails sitting in with, uh, with the victims or the victim's family multiple times and listen to their uh, stories about the violence, about the, the crime. When, when you think about doing it with five, six different cases, this can be emotionally draining. And uh, the, these participants uh, mentioned living through secondary, secondary trauma because of the, this and uh, taking therapy to, to cope with it. Although uh, mostly negative feelings are discussed as a factor that that brought these women these women to volunteering, uh, such as feeling anger, hate, or fear. Uh, there are also positive feelings that also make them make them stay in the movement and uh, continue what they are doing. I believe through taking these feelings into account, not just as a private matter, but as something that has a political and social reflection, we can have a more holistic approach to the experiences of volunteering and the feminist movement in Turkey. The, here I want to share the first example uh, from a Sunaz interview. Uh, she's again talking about what brought her to this movement and she says, this solidarity makes you feel so strong somehow. Even though I have not experienced, experienced it in my life gratefully, this is something that disturbs me greatly. That I always keep my eyes and ears open and some nights it disturbs me so much that I can't even sleep. Uh, so we see that feeling sad, being uncomfortable, being disturbed has brought Suna to this moment. Uh, volunteering, in a way, became the way she responds to these feelings. However, feeling strong because of the solidarity also keeps her in the moment. She sees the inequality in the society and acts upon it. And it is obvious that her feelings are central to this decision. The other example is from Nehir's interview. Uh, she, she has an Insta Instagram account with more than 3,000 followers and she uses this as a platform to raise consciousness about feminism and gender equality. Uh, it all, has also become a platform where women share their uh, violence stories uh, and uh, the physical and emotional violence they had to endure in their lives and they try to find solidarity through this account. And when analyzing this situation, Nehi says, people share their horror stories with me. I am exposed to awful stories every day. In those stories, like I said, there are some par parts that I identify myself with. I say, oh, I also experienced this. Listening to these stories makes me fear and doubt everyone too. So, I think we can analyze Nehir's reaction to people's stories uh, in two ways. On the one hand, this makes her feel empathy towards her followers and creates a supporting environment for them. On the other hand, this makes her feel suspicious and uh, fearsome towards strangers around her. She starts to doubt everything and everyone because she listens to people uh, how people who look normal can turn into or actually be uh, violent beings. So yes, she's happy to create this solidarity and uh, this uh, em empathy in her in her Instagram account and give support to these women. Women, but also this has somewhat negative effects on her personal life too, and she ha she is dealing with this in her daily life. So to wrap, wrap it up, uh, in the literature, volunteering has been argued in uh, two ways, as a personal gain or a personal choice, or as a political stance and a political act. So in this research, my aim is to look at the, the gray zone in between, the, that in between space located where uh, political and personal context, context meet. Uh, through volunteering about a topic that deeply resonates in their personal lives. Uh, these participants negotiate how feminist activism can be a space where they challenge politics and change personally in the process.
Thank you. Um, this is it from me. I know it was a lot of information for a short period of time. Hope it all is clear or uh, we can discuss it further. I am excited to hear your comments and questions. Thank you for listening. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, and with that, I open the floor to, um, to uh, your questions and comments. Yes. If you have any questions, you can just turn on your camera and you can ask the question. Or if you're otherwise, uh, you can also just, yes, begin. Thank you, Asla. Uh, I thought it was really well structured. So it was, it was a lot of form, uh, information, but one could follow it really well. Thank you for this presentation. Um, I was already, we have spoken about the topic, so I was like really happy that I could see today what you're doing. And um, I have um, uh, two questions uh, where I would like to hear maybe a little bit more from you, from your material, very interesting material that you also have. Um, so one uh, would relate to uh, what uh, this is very specific to feminist mobilization mm -hmm. or let's say women NGOs, I don't, you know, whichever concept you're using, uh, working with. Um, so um, you started by saying you uh, very convincingly showed how everything got very tighter for women in particular in the changes in Turkey. So does that also really, I mean, is that something you saw that specificity also in the interviews? Mm -hmm. um, because the problem is that with the increasing repression on any form of activ activism, uh, or only particular kind of voluntary work is tolerated, um, the kind of emotional attachments that you're describing is, of course, prevalent also in other groups, not just, you know, on the particular theme of feminist uh, work or, you know, uh, women's engagements. Is there, I mean, could you see something that is explicitly related to this nexus um, of, you know, um, women being particularly also in the target of some of these policies uh, that you described. That was number one. And um, number two is a question that I'm also dealing with. So I just want to hear what you, uh, what your response is, is, you know, this demarcation between emotional attachment, you know, I mean, the, when you said these two arguments that you put together, how can you clearly delineate them? right is not a particular affective emotional component also in the first one so how do you uh, do that also methodologically like when you say okay this supports that argument and that supports this argument uh, how do you do you look i mean do you do a discourse analysis with your interviews or what you know how do you uh, analyze your data uh, basically um, so that's for that for now and i'm really looking forward to hear more. Thank you, Asla. Thank you. So I should, should I answer in right now or do you Yeah, sure. Why don't you go ahead and answer this question, yeah. So for the, for the first one, thank you for these wonderful questions. I kind of figured you would ask uh, about effect because we're kind of interested in the same uh, theoretical approach. Uh, the first one, uh, yes, definitely, uh, there is, like I described, there's a tight space in the Turkish civic activism. And uh, I've, did, I've done interviews with uh, women who volunteer and women who actually coordinate the volunteers. Uh, so I think uh, in, in the interviews where I talk to women who uh, coordinate the, the volunteers or try to recruit uh, volunteers, I think the tight space was very clear because they were complaining all the time about how hard it got to get people in the movement and um, convince them that this is this can lead to somewhat uh, a positive result because um, they most of the women uh, they complained about how it is hard to see results in this tight political space and it is very hard to motivate uh, volunteers when they don't see a, a concrete or a somewhat positive results uh, from their volunteer, volunteer work. And I think um, this was one of the instances that I saw how that uh, tight uh, space 
resonates in the in the interviews and also I think uh, we also talked about how uh, people chose to be um, go go online or do online interviewing or uh, they want to be anonymous and they don't really want to uh, put themselves out there because it's it can be dangerous uh, seeing all the uh, suing and uh, all the craziness about freedom of speech in Turkey right now that you can't really criticize anything openly and it can be scary at times and I think that also very much affects uh, the women's movement and I know that this can also affect other movements too and not specifically women's movements but when you're um, referring to uh, the state as a patriarchal state that discriminates women and that's push uh, puts pressure on women and it can be very uh, hard to uh, to to analyze that in in tv or on tv or publish something about that uh, very like clear stance uh, so i think these are the, the the ways that i saw the tight space in the the interviews and uh, thinking about if there were any politics that um targeted specifically women i think uh, the 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 istanbul convention argument was very uh out there and clear and i actually yeah we, i actually talked about this with the the participants because that was the most uh the recent uh movement that happened and also the the murders that still continue and um that they still try to uh, resist and protest against so i think um Yes, there are definitely uh, certain politics that Turkish state uh, wants to uh, not oblige with Istanbul Convention. It's just in the movement's movement, it was it, like a craziness for them because that basically means not trying or not criminal criminalizing women's uh, violence against women. So I think, uh, yes, there are definitely politics specifically targeting women. And um, for the second um, question, yes, I am dealing with that too, thank you. Um, it is very hard because you hate the politics and you fear the politics and you get angry at the politics as well. And actually emotions become a, a result of those politics too. So it is very hard to, uh, I think, uh, separate those two uh, arguments and uh, I really don't want to do that in my writing. I, 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 maybe it came off as like two different arguments because I tried to like structuralize it a lot for this presentation. But I think there are like certain interviews that is very heated and uh, it is so hard to, to say this is about politics and this is about feelings because they merge all the time. And I think methodologically, um, there are certain questions towards the end of the interview that I we ask, ask to them and say, how do you feel about being in this movement? How do you feel when this Erdogan said this? What, this? what does this make you feel? So I think those questions are the ones that target specifically at their feelings. And the first couple of questions that I have about how do you got into the movement and um, how do you feel about the current political uh, climate in Turkey? are mostly uh, targeting that political conjecture. But like I said, there are like certain interviews where I look at one sentence and then the next one is like, well, the first one is politics and the next one is feelings. And it's just, it's very hard to, to uh, separate. So yeah, I, I also deal with that and I hope I can come up with a, a good uh, holistic argument where, I, where both of them talk to each other. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, I'd like to open the floor for other questions. Um, who would like to ask a question, please just uh, turn on the camera and uh, go ahead. Elizabeth, will you? Yes, go I ahead. I would have a question. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I think it was really interesting. Um, I would be interested in, do you also uh, uh, make comparisons to other uh, women's movements, like when we have the example of the um, uh, abortion, the new abortion law, the strict abortion law in Poland, and uh, what kind of 
uh, movement this um, somehow like how do you say uh, the situation in Turkey and the situation of women in Turkey differs from the situation of Polish women? Great question, because uh, this is actually discussed in the uh, women's activism right now in Turkey, because they are showing utmost support to uh, Poland, women in Poland, and their uh, protests, because they actually resonate a lot with what Turkish women are trying to do right now. And uh, I think it would be definitely valuable to uh, look at how uh, the similarities and the differences between those two movements. But of course, there is the element that Poland is an EU country and th Turkey is not an EU country. And uh, there are very different dynamics, but uh, the, the current protests in, in Poland definitely looks very similar to what Turkish women are trying to do right now. And uh, that would be a good uh, paper project for me. And I think it is definitely related to what I'm doing because I'm seeing a lot of heated arguments there too and a lot of feelings of um, resentment and uh, anger towards the state, which actually we can see in the Turkish women's movement as well. Uh, and uh, thank you for this question, because I think uh, the Turkish, Turkish uh, women's movement is actually trying to translate as much as they can from the Polish uh, women movement, because they want to kind of show that this is not actually specific to Turkey, but this also happens in different countries as well. And they are trying to compare the responses from the government to the responses in Turkey from the Turkish state. So. Uh, yeah, this is def definitely a good, uh, that would be a good comparison. And um, so I would love to like write a paper on that. And I hope I can get to do that. Thank you for this question. Okay. Are there other questions we might have? Um, while we're waiting for people to articulate their questions, I mean, I would be interested, I was also going to ask a similar question to, to Elizabeth about the links with other um, mm -hmm with other movements, uh, women's movements and organizations. But my question would be more about the internal organizations in Turkey. I mean, to which degree are the, the, the activists and the movements, you know, do they see themselves, I mean, you're kind of, of course, implying that they're part of a larger, you know, uh, they have a larger political foundation and so on. But to which degree are they, you know, linked with communicating with other movements, you know, LGBTQ movements, um, Kurdish uh, movements, uh, other kind of movements which are critical of the of the kind of uh, authoritarian government, and how do they see themselves within that? And of course, once you're in this, once you're clearly active on the opposition side, of course, it also restrains your political space because you probably can negotiate less with the government. But maybe that moment is anyhow gone for a long time already. So I'm just kind of curious to hear your view on that. And then we have some questions afterwards. Um, so the, the, actually some of the women worked at collectives, which are mostly, um, they are not very like hierarchic, hierarchically organized. They are very um, feminist. So in the way that they try to be inclusive and uh, try to, uh, join in other movements and protests as well but to be honest i right now this is a very still a crucial problem uh, which has been like discussed and starting from 1980s that uh, the the women's movement in turkey or in istanbul to be to be more precise is not really including other movements or supporting other movements um so I think this is still this is still discussed, but I I believe they are they said that they are trying they are organized in other uh, towns as well in the in the east in the west in the south so they have a multiple different uh, cities and they try to organize protests in those cities as well and join in with other uh, Kurdish or um, other LGBT movements, but I don't think this is a very um, apparent thing, to be honest. And I still see a little um, disagreement on the part of 
the way women's movement is articulating their arguments and not really uh, focusing on especially LGBTQ plus movements and not really even in the women's marches uh, there's still the issue of uh, including uh, trans women and um, there's still arguments going on about how uh, women's movement is still uh, very white and uh, very educated and very uh, socioeconomically privileged. Uh, they are definitely trying to, um, some, some collectives and some feminist movements uh, try to deal with that and uh, openly talk about how intersectionality is still a problem in the movement, mm -hmm. but yeah, for me, I don't still, in the interviews as well, like there was of course this uh, desire to be more inclusive and more engaging and more in communication with other movements. But when I look at the, what they're actually doing, and I can't really see that in the movements, to be honest. And I think uh, that can be a good, good discrepancy to analyze because what they are saying is not really uh, seen out there and um, yeah it is still a problem because the movements there are a lot of NGOs and um, collectives and initiatives in Turkey for uh, women's rights and there is a little there's a problem with them becoming together and just like doing something together but when there's something huge like Istanbul Convention which is like uh, a big problem for everyone it's a common problem for everyone then we see all of them coming together but for small um small community uh, works or small field works or projects we see a very uh individual that's individualistic or um project focused and ngo focused mm. approaches and not really very inclusive Thank you for that question. Great, thanks. Uh, Laura uh, wanted to ask a question. So Laura, please. Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you, Ashley, for your presentation. It was very kind of uh, interesting to see, but also reminded me of some kind of things from the field. Um, my questions were perhaps be a bit more theoretically oriented, meaning uh, there's a lot in theory, for example, what you describe is a lot of what in social movement theory is described as the latent phase. So movement work, uh, more of movement work than movement active, right? So it's, uh, but in the context of authoritarian uh, or even semi-authoritarian states, uh, this latent, uh, what would be called the latent phase, it's actually more, uh, kind of more serious. It's not just movement work. You're actively, even in private, you're actively kind of going against the state and yeah. building some sort of resilience. So I wonder how you see kind of um, this, just to reflect more, I mean, you started off with this, but I just wanted to hear more about your thoughts on this idea of, you know, um, repression, uh, uh, movements vis-a-vis -vis repression, especially you know, considering the nature of the beast and that's, you know, different. It's not, you know, like most movements are studied in uh, Western Europe, this is different. So what are your reflections on this? What is the innovation in terms of that? Um, and also just looking at the, at the movement itself, it seems that all the time these movements have to adapt to what they can do and what they can't. Um, so would you say that there's been any innovation that these organizations have had to kind of you know, think up in order to keep uh, movements active. As you said, when repression gets strong, uh, a lot of activists draw back. Uh, but then they still continue in these private spheres where there's this duplicity. They do one thing in private and another thing in public or, you know, whispered resistance. Um, but have you seen anything in your research that made you, like, struck you as, you know, being an innovative approach of doing movements in a increasingly repressive atmosphere uh, mm -hmm. that we could learn from. I mean, I also uh, research social movements and I would be very interested to see, you know, what Turkish activists have been up to in terms of innovating new methods of being, you know, being out there and really, you know, sticking it to the man <laughs> in that sense. Yeah, exactly. Uh, thank you for your question, Laura. Um, I personally don't really uh, look at the political science and social movement uh, theoretical approaches because 
once I delve in that, I believe that it will be hard for me to like get out of it. And being a gender scholar, I try to more focus on um, feminist approaches to movement. And I didn't really mention what uh, theories I'm using for this research, but um, I am actually doing uh, and a lot using Foucault's governmentality and um, Sarah Ahmed, Ahmed's uh, emotion affect uh, research uh, theories. So I, I value uh, your feedback a lot, lot and I think we should have a talk about the social movement theoretical approaches and I think it will be very valuable but if someone can really sum it up for me and <laughs> tell me about it. Uh, so I don't know if I can really answer that question because I'm not looking at those theories and I'm not really indulged in them and I don't want to really make any uh, bad uh, or uh, wrong comments about them but I would love to have a have a little chat with you about these and so that we can see how this research can fit in that uh, theoretical approach. Are you, you going to say something? I would be very happy to <laughs> yeah, exchange ideas. Um, but just then to bring it down from the social movement theory, you know, if, if someone who is, uh, I'm playing the devil's advocate, but again, like for the purpose of being more hopefully bringing more enlightenment in that sense. But, you know, from the perspective of Western Europe uh, or, you know, some very open democracies, when we talk about, you know, people gathering and doing kind of this important work, um, uh, oppositionary work, let's say, sometimes it seems, I know, you know, it has been a reflection of mine as well, but, you know, um, how do you... Um, how do you explain that this is not as simple as it looks? That is not just NGOs uh, gathering, but they're actually doing, because of the price that they have to pay, the potential price that they have to pay, that this is actually very important and very, um, perhaps even dangerous work, even though it seems like just NGO work. Um, so how aware are activists that there's this discrepancy? I mean, you know, 10 years ago, they didn't have to think about most of the things that they have to think about now, right? You know, uh, security wise and safety wise and, you know, how you mobilize. So do you think that move with these groups themselves have gotten maybe, you know, have they gotten more careful about how they meet? Have they considered more, you know, this uh, idea of who they let in the group? It, has there been any shift because of the re kind of how the state reacts, you know, with the mm -hmm. imprisonments and things like that? Of course, activists have to be more careful. Um, mm -hmm. So I just, yeah, some highlight in terms of reflection of that, because then it doesn't become so normal in the sense of just NGO work, but no. it's actually, you know, quite, courageous work that most of these activists do that, you know, could cause them to go to prison even, uh, which wouldn't necessarily be the price anywhere else or in many other countries. So yeah, just this discrepancy always mm. is interesting. To <laughs> this actually uh, takes me back to my uh, initial purpose for my dissertation and my uh, hopes as a second year PhD student, uh, because I, I actually wanted to look at different NGO work and compare them. So this project was actually going to be, like you said, looking at different NGO work and see how uh, feminist activism differs from other movements or other NGO work. Because uh, I will, let's say you work in a environmental activism uh, NGO and you write reports. So this can be very different than a feminist woman going out on the street and protesting and being tear gassed and you know like all that danger that they're facing so I I kind of wanted to look at that discrep discrepancy in the uh, at the beginning and I just had to downsize my research because there was so many things to look at if I were to compare uh, but yes there is definitely a discrepancy and I think we, we see this um, especially when we look at the way the movement changed uh, from like 1980s to today because in in 1980s uh, there were mostly consciousness raising groups and books were published and articles were written and it was still a hard time to be a feminist activist but it was not that out there on the streets so but right now with this uh tightened space uh tightened political space and uh, it, it is very dangerous to 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 resist the state openly. Uh, I think we we definitely see the, the the in the way that, for example, they 
they were saying like the state kills these women and that was like a headline for one of their um protests and they were like accusing the state openly for all the women's uh, murders happening in the in the in turkey but then because this was uh repulsing a lot of volunteers and a lot of women activism activists because they were scared to be a part of this uh, heading this title uh so they had to tweak it a little bit and just like change it uh, to make it more um softer and uh, this actually kind of damages because they want to have a stance they want to have they want to show that they are against the state and they want to be open about it and direct about it but also we see that they can't really be because this affects their uh, volunteers and their work and they actually value uh, the work more than showing their uh, stance because this they say that this work has to go on and it is more important than being very uh, political about it um, but yeah i don't know if this answers your question but i think i see a lot of social media activism uh because that is kind of seen as a way as a safer way to carry out uh activism rather than being on the streets i see a lot of um online things happening because of corona of course but also before that there were a lot of uh podcasts and a lot of uh webinars being done and uh i was actually surprised because that was not a thing before like five years ago this was not a thing of course podcasts and uh webinars was not that popular at that time but also uh, it was always a very um physical movement and now i see that it is a very online and actually some uh some participants in this research said that uh, the, there are certain uh, ngos that specifically protests on the street and they're known for that and some participants said i can't do it i have a family and i have i can't do that and i i admire their work but i can't be a part of it so yes there is a discrepancy that um feminist movement is actually seen as a dangerous and um threatening movement and that is actually why i wanted to talk to these volunteers because i wanted to understand like how do you go out and protest when you know that you can be arrested and you can be tried and you can be accused of some being a terrorist to be honest so that was actually one of my starting points and i think i i tried to look at that discrepancy to be honest and i hopefully can at the end of i i hopefully can have an answer at the end of this <laughs> phd but we'll see thank you for your question great thanks uh are there any other further questions uh we have time, has, time for one more question yes i have a short question thank yes. you um i have a one uh, methodological question uh what was your positionality uh during your research whether you also participated or how um i didn't get like the your role within all the movement and uh, uh you know something more about it thanks yes thank you very much i think this is a very important question when you're doing a feminist research um and i my positionality was that i i volunteered before uh my phd and i i still volunteer uh at a big known ngo and i translate articles i didn't i go out but not that much to be honest and i when i was talking to the volunteers i actually made that clear because i think it is important for them to know that i am i participate somewhat in the movement but not as much as them and i this definitely changed the dynamics a bit because uh maybe they could have talked uh more comfortable with someone who know knew, knows the movement and uh, yeah, i i i was wondering especially about uh, all this um a uh, block of your research about emotions so that's kind of a very important to outline also your uh how do you deal with it as well thanks yes i think uh, when we were when we came to questions about emotions uh it was actually both of us complaining about the situation in turkey and uh for me 
uh, seeing I can't watch the news anymore and uh, because it just makes me upset and uh, angry. And when we were talking about this in the research, uh, we were actually, we stepped out of the interviews and we kind of started talking as women living in Turkey and dealing with gender issues. And I think it was a, it was a valuable part of this research because this also helped, helped me sort out my feelings about the movement and about the gender inequality going on in Turkey. But also they told me that um, it helped them to articulate the ways in which they engage with, with this movement. And I think, yeah, talking about feelings was not easy uh, because there were tears for sure when talking about this because some, some of them were um, closely engaged with the, the murder, murders and uh, traumatic stories. And they had some uh, abuse stories that they told me. And it was very hard for me to step out of my uh, role uh, I, to, to step in as a researcher because I was a, I'm also a woman and a feminist and a researcher and I also live in the same society. So uh, yeah, emotion, the part about emotions was a very challenging uh, positionality. And I was actually uh, thinking about writing this on the, as a blog post for, uh, for the center. And this was my idea, the, 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 the inter doing an interview about uh, emotions and um, feelings about feminist movements. So maybe you'll read more about that in the blog. <laughs> I, I, I sure hope, hope so, because, so. <laughs> because I think that's exactly kind of, I mean, this question on positionality, I mean, also as an activist, especially as an, you know, in, in a complicated and difficult environment like that is certainly, I think, a very, very interesting topic to reflect on. So, so I think that would be, would be great. Um, so yes, so, uh, so we have to wrap it up here. Thank you so much for your presentation. I think it was very inspiring, as you could see by the questions. And um, well, you know, we wish you all the best of luck with uh, wrapping up with your PhD. But it seems like you're on a good <laughs> you're on a good path there, from what we could hear. Um, so. And uh, just as a reminder for everybody, we'll have our next Brownback seminar next week, um, and it's called Debordering and Rebordering Processes in Southeastern Europe, and it's our a senior fellow as with the um, field of excellence on Europeanization, Marta Zorko from Zagreb, who will be presenting to us on the 24th of November at one o'clock with the same link as for this brown bag. So thanks everybody for coming. Thanks everybody for joining and uh, thanks for the presentation and see you soon. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. All the best. Bye-bye.